I would like to ask everyone who is not a speaker to go on mute. And uh, I'm delighted to invite our speakers, Georg and Isabel, please, the stage is yours. Thank there you for the kind introduction. <laughs> so Isabel, you, you want to go first and introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, hi, I'm Isabel. I'm working at Olopis, a small fintech company in located in Berlin, small meaning like 200 people. And we officially started using Inosys in 2017. Um, roughly a year after we started, we shared our learnings in a case study in the in one of the Inosos books and we will see how our, our journey continued in this talk today. Georg, how about you? Yeah, hi, my name is Georg Rutter. I am a software developer and I work at Bosch IO. That's a, a part of the uh, Bosch company, the IoT division. Um, I've also been part of introducing and uh, driving Inosource at Bosch in 2009. And obviously I'm a huge fan of Inosource. Um, it has literally changed my career, and I hope I can help others um, to apply and benefit from the from this working model as well. So going through this talk, we will look at four perspectives. Uh, we will see how Innosus initiatives can be scaled. Um, for both of us, we started with um, smaller experimental um, teams. We will share how we scaled that to the entire company in this talk. We will also go into some detail about how the Innosus Commons community helped us. We will show you some unexpected side effects that we had when introducing Innosus and when telling people more about the Innosus initiative. And finally, we will show you how to move beyond just source code, how to move beyond coding. Okay, and Isabel just mentioned this book here, Adopting Inner Source. Uh, it's a collection of case studies that um, Klaas, who's also here on the call, and Denise collected. Uh, both our stories, Europace and Bosch, are in there in much more detail than we will present today. <clears throat> but it's also like it was published in 2018, so a few things happened since then. Um, it's actually free download on the Inner Source Commons, so you can totally get it. And I think, Denise, correct me if I'm wrong, it's still the most frequently downloaded EPUB from O'Reilly? Or have we been overtaken? It's recently? the most frequently downloaded non-code asset oh. on public GitHub, much oh. bigger than O'Reilly. So this is that. Um, before we move on, we would like to give you a sense of how different our companies are with respect to a couple of metrics. Uh, as you can see here, um, Bosch is kind of ginormous <laughs> in the number of employees, and Europace is much smaller. Um, I think the difference is that Bosch has no software background, really, uh, no software culture. And I'm guessing, Isabel, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Europace, in contrast, has one. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, we that's... have like 50% of our employees oh. are actually um, employed as software engineers, but we are very much closer to technology. Right. Well, yeah, that's true. At least software technology, right? And um, at Bosch Innersource, it started before the Commons even existed in 2009. So unfortunately, we were not able to benefit from the many lessons learned that have been documented here. Um, that was different for Isabel, I think. Um, and as you can expect, our approaches to introducing and driving Innersource uh, look a bit different as a result of this difference that you can see here on the slide. Uh, but it's not totally different, as we will also see. First, look into how to scale the initiative at Europace. So, at Europace, people were using some kind of open source best practices in their development, or they were trying to use it, but not under the term inner source. That started with a more formal um, initiative in 2017 when I joined. So, the way we did that was to take a very um, problem oriented approach to roll out best practices. So, we took people together identified specific problems, prior, prioritized those problems and limited in, in terms of scope, and try to identify a solution, apply to the solution. If you look at this um, circle, you will see that this very much um, matches how our patterns are being formulated. And that's also, if you look at the next slide, um, where we could identify some of the patterns that helped us early on. One of them was to have a dedicated community leader. I mean, you can always start without one and 
go forward with that. But having a dedicated leader means that you will avoid some dead ends and you will have one that person dedicated to pulling people together and to kind of like uh, keep the ball rolling. What helped us as well, which is now, which has been formulated as a pattern is to start as an experiment so that we could iterate fairly quickly in a local environment. We started with just two teams working on one project together. And that allowed us to um, identify very early on what the friction points were when rolling out in, also in our culture and in our company. And a lot of those lessons learned could then be taken and replicated across the company when scaling the initiative. So that, now if you look at the next slide, you will remember that we have this tight loop of identifying problems and finding a solution for them. Um, when you look at the next slide, you will see that you can take this loop essentially again, you observe the resulting context and you check whether your situation has improved. And what we did if the situation improved is that we reused that pattern at a larger scale that we recommended it to other teams to use it as well, and then entered the loop again, looking for new issues to, um, to solve. Now, essentially, if you look at that loop, you will find something that is um, similar. There is a loop that I know from data science, but which is actually much, much older, and that is the loop on the next slide, which is called the UDA loop, where first you observe then you orient, then you decide and you act. And the trick here is that you want to tighten this loop. You want to make it as tight as possible so that you can iterate very quickly. Now the trick when you um, start rolling out experiments in a very limited context is that you can iterate quickly and that you can take those lessons learned and scale them out to other teams and other contexts. Now over to you and your Bosch story. Yeah. Okay. So um, our beginnings were somewhat differently motivated, I would say. So we had uh, at the time, 2009, even eight or earlier, lots of fans of open source in the company, but what was not, Bosch was not really doing open source. Um, but we did see that, you know, the way that software was developed in the open source space, especially the Linux kernel was developed way more efficiently than we did internally, our ECU software and stuff. So we wanted to see if we could actually learn from open source and if we could apply the working model or replicate the working model within Bosch, if that would also work. That was the, the intention behind this initiative that we started in 2009, yes. So we started as an experiment similar to what, um, to what Isabel just told. We also had dedicated community leaders. So in that sense, it was different, uh, the same. Um, but unlike Europace, at least as far as I understand it, it was embedded in a strategic project, a top level project. It was funded by the board of management. So it got lots of visibility in management and also lots of expectations down the road, which did not always make things easier. And the initial promise that we made was actually that we were able to double the efficiency of software development. That's how we got into the game. Luckily, no one ever asked us if we really <laughs> achieved that <laughs> in the end. Um, yeah, so that was that. Uh, what we see here is what we call the biosphere. That's basically our little uh, experiment that we set up with a, you know, with guardrails and also some protection around it because again, the, boss, the whole how Bosch worked at the time was radically different. Um, so we had we started with all the handful of communities of which the logos you can see here. Um, these communities were in basically stuff that was started from the ground up. So we were not starting with uh, projects which had business relevance at the time. So it was truly an experimental playground, playground for us. And also the uh, trusted committers or the community leaders had 100% of their time. Um, and I, I would say also our approach was not necessarily iterative like uh, Isabel's. Um, and even though it was embedded into a strategic project, uh, we managed to keep our inner source space as self-organizing as possible and structures basically emerged organically as we went. Uh, one pretty obvious example where, that I've not see, heard before anywhere is that we didn't even prescribe the, the collaboration platform. We had no GitHub, no Stash, no, no, no Bitbucket in the beginning. That just happened organically and the community just decided which one they would want. And we still have that to this very day. The only major guardrails that we had, and I think that's also similar to what you did at your pace, uh, Isabel, is that we had some principles in place which would guide the evolution of InnerSource, so to speak. And those have been super important. And just to summarize it really quick, it was like five things, openness, transparency, self-determination, and meritocracy, and voluntariness. That was the fifth, yes. 
Um, and perhaps differently from many inner source initiatives that I've heard, our focus was not so much on um, on efficiency, on gaining efficiency or making contributions possible across silos. It was really focused on innovation, um, which is interesting and really important for, uh, for the fact that it actually was able to move on. Um, alignment with business, you would think, especially with self-organization, is kind of a thing that would not happen, but it actually did happen automatically. If you think about it, um, a software being written in the bio space or in a source space ending up in a product is the major motivation for developers. So that happened automatically. There was really no need to steer that in any way is our experience at least. But the true value of inner source proved to be not, as I said, again, an efficiency, but really innovative new products, which very likely wouldn't have been created otherwise. And also, and that is maybe even more important, what we did there and the way we collaborated served as a blueprint for distributed asynchronous collaboration, and which is now kind of the benchmark and it's applied throughout Bosch, which is a big deal in my opinion. Yes, so patterns. We also had some patterns. Some of the patterns actually originated within Bosch. I mean, start as experiment is strictly speaking, not a Bosch invention, but we also started that way. And I think this goes a long way in proving that this is actually a really valuable way to start in a source. We had dedicated community leaders. We had contracted our early contributors, which also helped. And we had this review committee, which is something that's helpful if you have a conservative, large organization, I think, which does not have a large software background yet. In that sense, it really helped. So we started with a really, as I said, with a really limited budget and a limited number of communities. And after three years, the experiment was deemed successful and InnoSource was opened up. And here you can see what happened. Um, so basically the number of projects increased by a factor of, what is it, 50 almost. Now we have over 500 projects. But still, we did not mandate anything anywhere. It continues to be voluntary to this very day. <clears throat> and it's almost 100% developer driven still. So all the growth happened really organically. And I'm sure it could have been faster, but our principles voluntarily, especially uh, kind of didn't allow for that really to push it in any sense. And I think it was the right decision after all. So we did scale and we learned a lot doing it. But before we talk about that, let's talk about the Europace experience of scaling up their initiative. So for us, what we did was to scale from individual teams to the entire organizations. And some of the challenges we came across was to build a common understanding of what InnoSource is about and what we want to achieve. As Georg already mentioned, um, principles helped a lot and um, carried us a long way. But at some point in time, what we needed was a pattern called maturity model in order to make transparent to teams which stages they were in and to make transparent um, which aspects of a project are being touched by InnoSource as well. So this is sort of a very good pattern in order to self-reflect. Um, what we also needed was some tips and tricks for beginners. So um, we, some of our tips and tricks we actually submitted as patterns to the InnoSource Commons on how to set up projects, on how to set up communication, because some things that we observed was that teams were agile and they were using some of the same tooling that InnoSource you know, projects will use, but they were using them on for a different purpose or in different ways. For instance, you will have an issue tracker, but in your HR team, the goal is to think the team and to know which of the items are in progress and not so much to capture long texts and explanations of what those changes are about. So you use the same tools, but for a different purpose and in a different way. And it helps to have that transparent to teams, especially as they start. Another thing for us was to introduce governance levels for advanced projects so that they could distinguish between this project looks like it does InnoSys because it does all of the mechanics, but it really doesn't welcome external contributions. Whereas this project that really want to do InnoSys that um, welcome external contributions and where external contributors are even welcome to become trusted committers themselves. Making that kind of distinction transparent helped avoid a lot of mis misunderstandings. We also used several patterns related to change management that we have on our repository um, to help guide the, the decisions of initiative leaders. Now, Europeas itself, on the next slide, you will see that belongs to a mother organization 
And we also um, scaled the InnoSource initiative to sister organizations, which led to additional challenges. First of all, um, within one organization, you typically have sort of kind of the same culture, at least the same values. As soon as you cross organization boundaries, this will be different. At some point, you will also um, stumble over diverging communication tools. Like with a small company with 200 people, you typically have just one tool for, say, chat, for instance. If you cross boundaries, that's much less likely. Plus, you do have legal implications. Um, but I think we will hear more about that in Georg's story in Bosch when it comes to transfer pricing. So some of the patterns that helped us scale, as I mentioned before, and as I mentioned on the next slide, is the maturity model. Essentially, it looks into different aspects of projects and defines three to four to five maturity levels that you can go through. What wisest helped our teams is that they suddenly realized that it's not only about being on GitHub, it's not only about accepting pull requests, but there are many more aspects that you have to look at in order to truly reap the benefits of inner source. And the other pattern that I mentioned before is the one about making governance levels explicit, because some things that we um, often encountered was that much like you have a project that looks like it does inner source, it uses pull requests, it does everything in the open, so external teams will assume that it's just open for contributions and it's open for becoming a trusted committer there as well, which leads to misunderstandings if that doesn't happen and making that transparent helps. Yeah. So now to the Bosch challenges. This looks bad, doesn't it? It's like a long list of challenges, but we've been at it for a long time. So, and uh, also we didn't have the benefit, as I said, of the inner source comments being there when we started. Nonetheless, and also some of these challenges here only apply, I think, due to the specific context we're in, like an old large company with no software background. So it might be somewhat different for you, but maybe still helpful. So here are the, the challenges that we encountered over time. So first one, being such a big company, sufficient internal publicity. It was so hard to actually reach the developers in our country uh, company. Uh, and when we started, we did not have a social network that was only introduced in 2013 or 12, something like that. Uh, that would have been hugely helpful, didn't have that. Um, also, making contributions to BIOS, there was had no career relevance in any way, uh, quite the opposite sometimes, because it was a time spent on not reaching your goals. There were no incentives. By HR, for instance, that would have been super helpful. We still don't have them to this day. Uh, and as a result, getting contributors was actually difficult, especially when you want contributions from a different silo. I was someone from a different silo would spend effort and the own silo wouldn't benefit from it. And uh, we have lots of silos, like 500 legal entities. And even in these entities, we have some silos sometimes. Um, has been, it's been much better than 2009, but still. Um, then cultural friction, which is obvious. Um, we come from an uh, electronic or mechanical engineering background. Um, there's not much understanding, well, there was not much understanding for open source and how that could possibly work. Um, the legal problems, especially transfer pricing, I will not go into detail, maybe perhaps in the, uh, in the Chatham House section afterwards, but that continues to this very day to be a problem. Um, also, I, I mentioned the growth that we had. It was at some point really hard to get an overview of all the inner source projects because um, basically we allowed also closed projects on our platform. And um, now we have like 85% closed projects and 15% open. So it's kind of like uh, hard to see the trees in the wood. Um, Middle management buy-in, I guess that's a challenge for everyone, at least in a non-software company. We started with a license, which I thought was pretty good, but then it turned out that it prevented later on releasing inner source software as open source because it was a strong copyleft license. So we kind of shot ourselves in the foot with that. Now the learning, <clears throat> and then the governance, which I think is mostly done in the open source program office. Um, that was not possible because we didn't have one at the time. We still kind of don't have one. It's something that business units do themselves. So that was also uh, a challenge. And some of these problems disappeared naturally the longer we did InnoSource, such as the lack of internal publicity or the cultural friction. That's pretty much gone this day, but it was a huge problem early on. Um, some of these challenges required 
quite a bit of experimentation, such as the governance, how we approach that, more on that in a second. And others uh, to this day remain a struggle, like middle management buy-in and also getting contributors and all the tax challenge even. Yeah, and just one example here for um, the governance model, because I think that's something that anyone, everyone has to do at some point when he starts in a source. Um, it changed over time. We started with a centrally funded team of five people who would basically provide the governance and help all these BIOS projects or inner source projects out there. And after three years, there was less money. So we only had three people left. Uh, then we tried crowdfunding when that money was gone as well. It didn't work so well because accounting in a, such a big firm is really hard and difficult. No one likes to do it. Uh, and then finally, we switched to a community-based model, which you see depicted here on the right, <clears throat> where basically there was a mandate from the board of management telling all business units, you guys should have someone in this community here and help take care of BIOS. And I think this community-based approach is reasonably successful right now. And I think we can take care of most of the problems that we see, all the challenges. Um, what else? Let's go have a look in my notes here. I think there's one more slide after that one. Yes, exactly. So uh, also some of the patterns that we started using in the beginning, for instance, dedicated community leader, that sadly went away because the funding went away. And now people basically do it, I wouldn't say doing their free time, but they don't have as much time as we did in the beginning. Um, also, we don't contract our contributors anymore. And that also resulted in a slight downturn of you know the number of contributions and all that. So um, also, not all the patterns are um, applicable throughout the whole lifetime of the uh, of the inner source initiative. And then over to you again, Isabel. So essentially, when you want to start an initiative and when when you want to um, grow it, you need cover from two perspectives. You need air cover, that is from senior management, and you need groundswell. Innosis doesn't work if your engineers don't buy into it and don't play along with it. But if you do not have air cover at some point in time, you will hit like a glass ceiling where you cannot go further. So essentially, you need buy in from both sides. Yeah. Um, one book that helped me and I came across it through the Innosis comments was How Behavior Spreads. Um, for the sake of time, just a recommendation to look into it. Um, it explains how, from a bottom-up approach, you can induce behavioral change and make that change spread across teams. And essentially what you need is bridges between those teams, bridges being um, people that are linked to both teams. And typically those bridges need to be wide. So it needs to be more than one or two people. Just a quick teaser. So how does the Innosis Commons help a apart from sharing helpful books? Georg, you wanted to do a quick advertisement for the Patterns book. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, so we've mentioned them a lot already. And I think um, the patterns that we collected and also formalized by the Patterns group in the Commons are one of the most valuable assets for anyone who starts or is already running an inner source initiative. And I wish we had them when we started in <laughs> 2009. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with patterns, uh, and really in a nutshell only, it's basically a description of a proven solution to a recurring problem in a very specific format, which uh, allows you to judge whether or not the pattern is applicable in your case, what the solution looks like, and what the consequences of applying the solution would look like if you, if you do that. And that's pretty much it. So it's basically a very useful problem solution pair. And if you come across a problem, check out our list of patterns on GitHub. We have 20 proven patterns here in this book on the screen that you can download uh, again on our website. And there are about 30 patterns on GitHub, um, some of which are still experimental or not proven yet. Uh, and if you find no pattern that's uh, applicable for your case, please do get in touch with us and let's together as a community figure out if we can not come up with a solution and maybe turn it into a successful pattern. Okay, then there's the learning path. <clears throat> uh, it's basically a set of training videos and workbooks which cover the most fundamental aspects of inner source. Um, they're really easy to digest and thanks to our community, they are also available in many languages now. Uh, obviously, we're also look, uh, always looking for more translations. If you're into that, that would be fantastic. Uh, fun story, I did one of these videos. Um, my native language is actually German, but of course I did the video in English. And then it turns out that a colleague at Bosch, whom I've never heard of before, actually translated it back to German, which I thought was kind of funny. <laughs> 
Okay, so it's not only um, videos. If you prefer readings, there's a ton of books that you can dive into. Most of them freely available, um, good resources to get started. Um, there's checklists, there's metrics, and there's case studies. And then along our journey, as Isabel mentioned at the very beginning, there were also witnessed some side effects which we did not really anticipate at the outset. And most of them positive, but some also negative. And we wanted to share those as well. We are in pandemic times. Um, Innosus makes it easy to go remote first, so at least for Europace and I believe for Bosch as well. It was like, a, like just a snip, uh, like just a snap. So it was very easy to switch to remote first. In our case, it was on Thursday, we were told that we ha would have to stay home only on Monday. And yes, there was a bit of friction, but not so much in the software engineering teams. So that was very, very easy. Um, another thing that we observed was having the right voc vocabulary helps talk about um, issues that you have on your teams already, but which were before weekly defined and kind of like hand baby. Um, having the right terms for that helps talk about those challenges and find actual solutions for that. So for some of our colleagues, InnoSource also made it easy to um, transition over to open source because they already know how interaction works internally. Some of them ma made contributions to upstream open source projects and that they found it fairly easy and natural after having learned how to do that internally. And there's one more <clears> that's simplified collaboration between legal entities. So I mentioned before that we have a ton of legal entities. And before we had inner source uh, collaboration in software across these legal entities um, basically had three options. So A, you set up complex collaboration agreements and contracts and all that, which is a lot of work. Uh, option B is you don't do that and accept collaborating in a gray zone. Of course, that never happened. <clears throat> Didn't say that or you didn't collaborate in the first place. I think that was the option that was very often taken. And I think we were at a loss of that. And with one stroke, uh, inner source replaced that with a well-defined and legally safe alternative. And we didn't really anticipate that would happen at the beginning. Um, so that was great. Um, and now to the negative side effects, <clears throat> which we didn't really anticipate in the beginning, but perhaps should have too. And I would like to call it the bureaucracy strikes back. It's possibly a problem of only very large companies. I'm not sure uh, what that looks like in Europe. Has. Um, so I, I think if you look back at the history of these, of these companies, like many large organizations started small and then th went through a long scaling process, process as the inner source did itself. And the lessons learned of these companies, I think have a large influence on their culture, basically, not just for Bosch, obviously. Um, and the lesson that most companies, at least the big ones, have learned at some point during their process is that bureaucracy, like formal hierarchies, division of labor, strict processes, and all that, help them avoid the initial chaos that they surely have witnessed at some point. And that, I think, made them at some point more efficient and contributed there to their success. And that was probably true, at least back in the day. Um, I personally like to think of InnoSource as like not a company in a company, but kind of a speedboat, if you will, if where you operate differently, at least for Bosch, that's the case. Um, and the usual bureaucracy does not necessarily apply, I mean, at least not in the same way. So to me, it feels like post-bureaucracy or Gary Hamill calls it um, humanocracy. Um, and that's at least how InnoSource started at Bosch. And many developers told me in, on our journey that they love InnoSource just because they can focus on really providing value and pretty much ignore the rest, like meaning ignore bureaucracy. But <clears throat> I think what's probably common, and I'd love to hear what everyone else has to say afterwards in the chat, um, especially when InnoSource grows to, um, you know, beyond a certain point and, you know, spreads throughout your company, becomes mainstream and business even start to rely on it. And you start leaving the haven of a safe experiment, so to speak, uh, things will start to get interesting, probably. I mean, think about it. I mean, if you look at inner source from a perspective of a bureaucrat, if you will, it probably does not appear overly efficient, right? I mean, the way we make decisions, the way the fact that inner source uh, defies the idea of a single wrenchable neck, as Denise once put it, is not or not very attractive, I guess. And the larger the inner source space grows, I think the more pronounced uh, these observations will become. 
And when an inner source initiative leaves its early stages and becomes more relevant for the company's success, I think we can expect the organization, uh, also known as the organizational bureaucracy, to embrace inner source uh, and I'm assuming with the best intentions, start to apply its tools and its solution to inner source as well. Uh, in our case, it started small, but it turns out to be a rather slippery slope. And before long, the character of your inner source initiative uh, can actually change. Um, here's how I know. I recently actually compiled a checklist for our developers to help them make an informed decision pro uh, or against inner source. And I was shocked to see the bureaucracy that actually um, aggregated in that checklist. And, um, I don't remember how many points it were, but you have to talk to a lot of people before you can make the decision at this point. And that's when it dawned on me that this has become too, way too bureaucratic. Um, it's still, don't get me wrong, it's still a world better than any regular project. project but um, what I have learned in the discussion with the various stakeholders uh, in our organization is that they have a very detailed and informed perspective on some aspects of inner source, on risks particularly. Uh, think about export control or think transfer pricing. Um, but however, they really seldomly understand the benefits of inner source and you know the value that it provides to the company and to the people working there. And I have heard from you know more than once from colleagues in central departments that they didn't really believe inner source can actually work. And then after 12 years of it already you know, doing so basically, because it's still radically different from how the rest of the company operates. And all that basically leads to really unbalanced decisions where people or the bureaucracy tries to avoid any risk possible at the expense of inner source success unless you work against it and that's where we are at the moment so my advice to everyone who is on their journey uh, in inner source is to start documenting and measuring the positive impact that inner source has like stories metrics whatever you can get early on from the outset so that when these discussions arise which they, they will at some point i'm sure um, you have some munition, if you will, right? And you can have a more balanced um, decision here. Uh, we did not do enough of that. And I think at the moment we're paying the price for that, but I still hope that we'll, we'll win eventually. Um, yeah, so don't make the same mistake that we did. Do collect lots of data. Um, one thing that we didn't do, but I think we should have done, maybe I would be interested to learn how that works in your companies as well, is to include um, inner source, when you do your open source scans, when you release software, then you usually have to do an open source scan, compile a bill of material, and then you should also see what inner source parts are in there so that you can have some data. We don't have that at the moment, and that would be super helpful to have. Yeah, that was a long way of saying you should read this book here. <laughs> I've only just started, um, but it really speaks to my mind. And I, to me, reading the first chapters, it really looks like we with inner source are at the forefront uh, of a new kind of company. And uh, again, I would really like to uh, recommend this book with the caveat that I haven't read all of it yet. So um, I'm pretty sure it's pretty good. Isabel, one more. So one caveat that we ran into was that those inner source like source code projects were so successful that people tried to use inner source for everything. And then they started blaming inner source when this analogy started breaking. So my recommendation for that was to keep the meaning of inner source intact and to use it for your source projects, but to use the principles and to, to translate whatever um, benefits you have within inner source and use it in different contexts, but use different terms in order to distinguish it from your core inner source initiative. One thing that we have established is um, based on the open decision-making framework, for instance, for higher level decisions. That's a framework that comes from um, um, Red Hat. And there you, you're much uh, more higher up than just on your source code repository. And that helps to have the same principles on uh, for different initiatives, but under a different name. And with that, we come towards moving beyond code. Um, one of those initiatives actually made it into our patterns repository. That's about transparent cross-team decision-making with requests for comments. For OOPs, we had the, the challenge that we had different units, which at some point had to set some standards, like which logging framework do we want to use? Um, how should our, our APIs look like? And using pure inner source terminology for that didn't translate very well. 
what we wanted to have was a process that is asynchronous where possible, that is transparent, and that allows for collaborate, collaboration across team boundaries. Um, we use this transparent cross-team decision-making, but essentially when in the Europeans we started doing that, this pattern didn't exist. So we used the terminology of the open decision-making framework, and that helped distinguish what is inner source and software development, and what is about standard setting and about higher level decision making. We did a similar thing with creating communities like on the next slide. If you check out the um, patterns of how you do software development in open source, but also in an inner source um, project, what you will find is that many of these patterns can be applied very nicely to organizing communities. And internally at our company, we have do have several communities of practice which are organized in the same transparent and open way and which are supposed to work similarly in an asynchronous fashion. So we could use some of the same collaboration patterns and tools and move the ideas and principles um, to another dimension there. Okay, so we're at the end of the talk now. I realize we're a bit over time. Sorry about that. <clears throat> but we can't stop the talk without giving some last words, obviously. Um, I would like to, you know, provide my perspective, basically, because why I think inner source is really the future of collaboration in software. I, I really firmly believe in that. Um, I think um, there's this truism that not those companies survive which are the fastest but rather the ones who are able to adapt to change more quickly than others right i think that's very true and the rate of change i think is accelerating rather than going down and i have experienced myself at bosch um, and i'm firmly convinced that inner source as a working model is way more suited to such a world because collaboration in like a diverse community um you know, which is more inclusive and also kind of more humane in terms of a working model, it's much more likely to generate the innovations that we will need to stay successful down the road and to drive change rather than to be outpaced of it. So that's why I think inner source is the superior working model that's here to stay. Isabel, any famous last words? I only concur. Um, I mean, I have a large open source background. And what I've seen there, I'm coming from the Apache Software Foundation, what I've seen there is that this open collaboration across organization boundaries, and there we are not only talking about um, departments or sister organizations, but real independent companies. What I've seen there is that this kind of collaboration means that um, all the boats are rising much faster. And I believe that Innosus is one way of enabling that within companies. But I do believe the logical next step is that um, colleagues to learn how that collaboration works and how to actually become more active upstream. I mean, we've seen that in our company where people became active within the InnoSource Commons, but also within projects upstream to their dependencies. And this is something that I would like to see enabled through InnoSource. <laughs>